Sheikh Imran Hussein, uh, we thank you for uh, giving us this opportunity to ask you a few questions uh, on behalf of Kalam TV and Mimba. Wa alaikum salam wa I'm very happy, Hussein, uh, to be here with you and I pray that Allah may bless this, uh, this interview. Thank you. I mean, uh, how do you think that Europeans are reacting today towards the shift in global power? There are many scholars in Europe. Mm -hmm. and in the United States whose eyes are opening and who are understanding that this civilization is being taken for a ride. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. um, it is necessary for all those who want to uphold the truth in the world, whether you be a Hindu, or a Buddhist, or a Jew, or a Christian, or a Muslim, or even someone who is secular in thought. Mm -hmm. We speak to the people of India, yes. Mm -hmm. We speak to the people of China, we speak to the people of the United States. Wherever you are in the world, and you stand for truth, and you oppose oppression, we say to you, let's come together. And we are one with it. It is something wonderful to behold that every day that passes by, the evidence increases more and more that large numbers of scholars in the Western world, their eyes are opening and they are coming forward and they are standing up with courage and integrity. And it's something marvelous to behold. I think there is a day tomorrow when we can come together and shake, hold hands together and in solidarity as we confront the oppressors of the world. The Turkish lira <coughs> is now falling off a cliff uh, following what we can describe as uh, US imposed economic sanctions. What's your analysis on what is currently happening and is there a willingness from external powers to shut down Turkey or is it all a mise en scène uh, to further a given agenda? I will only respond to one part of your question. Mm -hmm. The other part I choose to remain silent. So let them guess. Mm -hmm. I will speak only about the liver. Mm -hmm. That's all. Um, the president of the Republic of Turkey, uh, Recep Erdogan, is a student and disciple of one of the greatest Turkish leaders of the modern age. Uh, that's Muddin El Bakan was his name. Uh, he died, uh, I think, in about 10, 20 years ago. And uh, one of the things which made him great, Najmuddin El Bakan, was that he recognized the gold dinar and silver dirham as the road for Turkish uh, survival. He recognized that monetary system, therefore, which was now prevailing in the world, which is now prevailing in the world, to be one which is a fraught with danger, and that survival required us to move from the existing monetary system to that monetary system which used to be there before and which is there in the Qur'an. Mm -hmm. Dinar is in the Qur'an and Dirham is in the Qur'an. And, uh, it is something surprising, therefore, that uh, Al Bakan, who is the student and disciple uh, of sorry, Erdogan. Erdogan, Erdogan, who is the student and disciple of Al Bakan, should be responding in the way that he is responding. I call it more than simply mysterious and mystifying. Oh yes, that he knows, he knows that the way to resolve the problem today with the Turkish lira, mm -hmm. he knows, is to do what Argentina did. 
switch to when Congo. Argentina was in a similar situation mm -hmm. to do what Serbia did when Serbia was in a situ similar situation of a free fall of the currency and that is to introduce gold and silver money in the market mm -hmm. he knows that mm -hmm. instead of doing what he's what can resolve the problem he's asking the people to take your sterling pounds and your euros and your whatever a hard currency you have and change that into liras. Does he not know that as the lira continues to fall in value and he cannot stop it, the people will be losing their wealth. So he's inviting the Turkish people to throw away their wealth. It seems to me to be rather foolish of someone who many people are asking, is this the new leader of the world of Islam? Is this the man who's going to lead the world of Islam now? And I say, even a schoolboy could do a better job than what he's doing. I'm going to switch now to Israel. Um, Israel in the past, <coughs> at the very least, um, they attempted to portray themselves as upholding human rights, although uh, they were blatantly um, uh, contradicting it. But now it seems that they're openly preaching military savagery and they're proclaiming it out loud. What could one read in this shift or change of, str of strategy on Israel's part? When Britain was launching its mighty effort to establish Pax Britannica, it took them quite some time. Britain was an imperial power which used the point of a sword to pursue our objectives. And Britain committed atrocities, uh, unspeakable. My forefathers had to crawl on the dust before the British master as an act of submission and subservience to him. My forefathers had to crawl on the dust before them. Good. They don't want to remember that now. When the United States was embarking on the process of establishing Pax uh, Americana, they exterminated the American Indians like cockroaches. Mm -hmm. Ethnic cleansing. <laughs> and they don't want to remember that now. Okay? Anytime a ruling state is embarking upon the effort to establish itself as a ruling state in this modern age, this is the way it behaves. Israel is now poised to try, at least they want to attempt, to replace the United States of America as the next ruling state. This is not taught in Oxford University. Oxford University will fire you if you say speak even a whisper about it. This is not talk at, taught at Harvard and at Yale and Stanford and, and uh, um, Temple University and MIT and so on. You, if you even whisper this, they'll fire you. Right. This is actually, this is actually the, the movement of history. That from our eschatological perspective, and every day the evidence mounts that we are correct. That Israel wants to replace the United States of America with a Pax Judaica that will replace Pax Americana. And hence it follows that in the same way that Britain acted so brutally, mercilessly, shamelessly to establish herself as Pax Britannica, in the same way that the United States acted so brutally in ex terminating the American Indians like cockroaches and yet going to church on a Sunday morning and pretending that you are a civilized people. Similarly, the same madness, the same satanic madness is manifesting itself today with Israel. Do you think that the rise of Trump was inevitable? There seems to be a large segment of the U.S. population uh, that supports President Trump and his policies, even though the media are trying to demonize him and portray him in negative terms. So what's your take on this? Uh, 
I learned something from Christian eschatology mm. when I went to Moscow. Mm. The Russian uh, Orthodox Christian eschatologist taught me what I did not know before. We have it here in Islam, but I didn't remember it. But they taught me mm. that even though something has been ordained to take place, mm. with prayer, with prayer, it can be postponed. Uh, I was of the considered opinion that the Great War, the Great Nuclear War, would take place in 2016, two years ago. Mm. I was expecting that war. I had several dreams, several dreams upon it. And I made it known around the world, I made it known that yes, I think the Great War is coming and it will come sometime in 2016. Mm. But I also prayed to Allah and many others prayed to Allah that it may be postponed for a while. If Hillary Clinton had won the elections in November 2016, mm. there would be no doubt that we would have already had a great war, that we would be on the doorstep of the great war since 2016. And most of mankind would have been destroyed already. This is what they wanted. But they planned their plan, and Allah planned his plan. And Allah took a man, took a man who is not the perfect man at all. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, Donald Trump mm -hmm. is most certainly not a perfect man. He do, he done many bad things as well. But the one thing that Trump has done is that the war has not taken place in the last two years. No matter who you are and you are my critic, you can't deny the fact that the war has not taken place as yet. Mm -hmm. We say that is a divine act of response to our, the prayers of our people, mm -hmm. praying. And I would to say further, not only were they surprised that Trump won the election despite everything they did to prevent him, oh yeah, they they did everything they could possibly do to prevent him from winning the election and yet he won the election. My conclusion is that so long as Trump is the President of the United States, they cannot trust him, so they cannot initiate, ignite the Great War. It may it be ignited by accident, but they are not going to take the chance while he is President. So now in the next two years that are left before the next general elections in the United States, mm -hmm. I anticipate that they're going to do everything they can possibly do to get rid of him. One of the ways, of course, is the JFK way. Mm -hmm. But the other way is, um, is uh, to, to get him impeached. impeached yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And if they fail to get him impeached, then they face the possibility Mm -hmm. which is the mother of all horrors mm -hmm. for them, mm -hmm. that he'd be re-elected for another four years. Mm -hmm. And that's the end of the world for them. So the fact that Trump is the United States president does not mean that we endorse him as a good Muslim mm -hmm. <laughs> and going to heaven. Mm -hmm. Stop that stupidness. The fact that Trump is the president of the United States for us indicates that the war, the great war with Russia is being postponed and we thank Allah for that. Women are now um, being allowed to drive in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and is uh, Mohammed bin Salman's um, uh, initiatives towards modernizing the mentalities in the Kingdom, is, is, it, is it a genuine act or is it just a mere act of propaganda to divert att attention from the ongoing war in Yemen which is known to uh, us today as uh, the world's worst humanitarian crisis. And also to explain how uh, such liberal propaganda is being used to hide an anti-liberal political agenda. Well, that's a number of questions in one, you know, Muhammad. I mean, I'm Hussein. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. About whether women uh, should be allowed to drive a car uh, well, they're all driving cars. My wife is driving a car. Um, it's a question for the Mufti. Mm -hmm. Let him answer that question 
So whether Saudi Arabia prevents women from driving or whether Saudi Arabia allows women to drive is not a matter of any consequence for me really. I don't think I need to pay any attention to that. Mm. No. Uh, but the war on Yemen is a different matter. Mm. Oh yes. Uh, our Prophet Allah's blessings be upon him. He prayed and he made dua. And in his dua he asked for something for Sham, which is of course part of Syria mm. today, and Yemen. Mm. His words were Allahumma barik lana fi shamina wa yamanina. Mm. So Allah grant us blessings in our Sham, Syria, mm. and our Yemen. Mm. And it is particularly interesting that the two places for which he asked Baraka are the two places which are now in fire. Mm. Why is it that at the same time do both places are in fire and who is who it is who is kindling the fire and keeping the fire flowing? Same Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is at the heart mm -hmm. of the attack on Syria. Saudi Arabia is leading the attack on Yemen. When he made the statement, Allahumma barik lana fi shamina wa yamanina, they asked him, and he's in Medina, at that time it was called Yetri, mm -hmm. they asked him, what about our Najj? They didn't ask about a Najj which is on the moon or in Venus or in Mars. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. They asked him about our nudge, but our critics simply forget the word our. Mm -hmm. yes. yes, they have a little bit of problem with their memories, our critics. Mm -hmm. yeah. Our nudge. If you are in Hejaz, in Makkah, mm -hmm. and you ask a question about our nudge, mm -hmm. and you do not recognize that it is next door to Hejaz, right there in the Arabian Peninsula, you should buy a one-way ticket to the moon. You have bogus scholarship. You should be dismissed. No one should bother to about you anymore. I mean, that is stupidity of the highest order. Where have your sense gone? Do you have, don't you have any sense in your head? And yet you dare to come to us to preach to us? A PhD in stupidity? Even a schoolboy would know. If you are in Makkah or in Medina, and you ask about our nudge, is not a nudge in Iraq, you foolish man? I'm sorry for my violent language, but they deserve it with their bogus scholarship. Mm -hmm. If you are in Medina and you ask about our nudge, then it is next door. Just next door is our nudge, that's not our nudge, that's not our nudge. This is our nudge here. Yeah. We're probably yes. to today this Saudi Arabia. Our, I'm sorry I have to devote so much time to this mm -hmm. because those those ignorant scholars out there with their bogus scholarships, they, they don't want to listen. Mm -hmm. They don't want to listen, yes. So when the people ask, uh, what about our nudge? <coughs> referring, of course, to the nudge which is next door. He said, he was silent. And when they repeated, and repeated the question, then he replied. Why was he silent? Why did he not reply? Because there's something bothering me. That's why. Mm -hmm. That's why. Mm -hmm. Tell that to that bogus scholarship out there, which is insisting that nudge is somewhere in Iraq. Then when he finally replied, he said from nudge pointing to the east, mm -hmm. not north and south, to the east. Pointing to the east, meaning next door. That nudge net go in Arabia, not one in Iraq. He said from there, earthquakes, from there, fitna, from there, Khatma Shaitan, the satanic age, from there. And that is precisely what the present regime in Saudi Arabia is doing. Mm -hmm. Distinguished scholars of Islam, for whom I have so much respect. Yes. I have enormous respect for Sheikh Saqqar al Hawari. Yes, and for Sheikh Salman al Awda. These are, these are learned scholars of Islam who, who earn the respect of this Ummah. These are distinguished scholars of Islam. These are men of integrity. From what I know of them, from their academic credential, it, being Sunni or Shia 
or Salafi or Sufi or so on, that does not come into play when it comes to scholarship. And these are learned scholars of Islam and they're in jail in prison in Saudi Arabia. Shame on you, shame on you, shame on you, Saudi Arabia. Shame on that government. And whoever supports that government, shame on you as well. Yes, shame on you as well. May Allah punish you for what you're doing because you are, you are, you are terrorizing the scholars of Islam. They might even be killed, they might even be executed. These learned scholars of Islam. And I have to raise my voice for my brother Safar, for my brother Salman, they are my brothers. I don't know, maybe they may be a little younger than me, they may be my the same age, but we are brothers. We are scholars of Islam, and if they did that to you today, they do that to me tomorrow. That is an evil regime, and whoever supports that regime should be thrown out of the place. We don't want to see your face. If you are supporting that regime, get out and close the door behind you. We don't want to see you. Sheikh Imran, I will just take this opportunity to divert from uh, my actual questions. And we know that Saudi Arabia today is holding, I would say, uh, according to uh, some uh, reports I read, the greatest number of scholars in the Muslim world. What can we... Uh, so, I didn't get that question. In Saudi Arabia, there is a huge number of Islamic scholars held in jails. Yes, in I jails. just answered yes. that. Yeah, but what can we do as individuals? You can do what I've just done. Yes. That's all I can do at this time. Raise the words. Anymore yet. To raise my voice and protest of what Saudi Arabia is doing and protest against all those ignorant people who are supporting that Saudi regime. Get out. We don't want to see your face. Close it all behind you. Um, Sheikh Imran, ideologies that may have seemed appealing to some uh, segments of certain populations, sometimes nations have come and gone. Marxism is dead. Communism is dead. Capitalism is dead or on its way to uh, dying, on its way to dying. And in a way, Islamism is dead. What new hope is there for people to hold on to today? I have never come across the term Islamism and I am 76 years of age. Mm -hmm. I never studied it in any book. I don't know what it means, Islamism. Mm -hmm. And when my enemies concoct in their, you know, their laboratories, mm. these curious terms. I, I don't use them. Uh, like uh, a Muslim cleric. I said, I'm not going to touch my tongue with that rubbish that comes from you. Mm. No. When I have terminology, which comes from the Lord God in the Quran, mm. I stay with that terminology. Now, insofar as Marxism is concerned, um, communism is concerned, socialism is concerned. We don't throw out and dismiss all of these things, just, you know, throw away the baby with the bathwater. No, no, no. In, uh, Dajjal is the one who brought communism into being. And he used the Soviet Union in order to attempt to destroy Orthodox Christian faith mm -hmm. in Russia to destroy Russia's spiritual heart. That was his purpose. But the Dajjal is very clever. Mm -hmm. He's not going to come with an attack which is totally false. He will give you 95% of dazzling truth mm -hmm. in order to slip in the 5% of poison. So there is, there is in Marxist thought, there is in communism, those parts of that economic policy and system and philosophy which resonates in a positive way with us. Mm -hmm. So when we meet the Marxist thinker, I have had Marxist thinkers as my teachers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And <laughs> they were very pleased with me. They liked me, yeah. Even though they were Marxists. Mm -hmm. One of the men who taught me economics international economics with a man named Bernard Cord mm -hmm. and he was Marxist mm -hmm. and he loved me very much yes mm -hmm. so there is there is a part of Marxist thought there's a part of socialist thought mm -hmm. which resonates positively with us so we don't dismiss everything mm -hmm. we try to search to see what is there which is positive and we identify with the positive 
and we dismiss that which is negative. If they had done that, Venezuela would not be in a mess which it is today. And Hugo Chavez is a man for whom I, I have tremendous admiration. Hugo Chavez. Um, Ahmadi uh, Najad, Mahmoud Ahmadi Najad, is a wonderful person. I met with him in, in Iran. Um, these are wonderful people. You mean the former? The former president. Okay. But um, they didn't know. They didn't know what is the market. What is a free and a fair market? Hugo Chavez doesn't know that, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad doesn't know that. Mm. What is a free and a fair market? Or what does the truth say about a free and a fair market? Mm. Truth is in Judaism, is there in Christianity, is there in Islam? Hinduism knows, knows about a free and a fair market. Mm. It is the free and a fair market which has to be restored. Marxists is railing against the corrupted market. Mm. We agree with the Marx Marxists. Mm in his analysis of the defects of the market. We do not agree with him on how to respond to it. So let us not dismiss the, all the isms which came before. And let us concentrate on locating that which is positive, which, which, with which we can agree in, what, in all these dispensations, in all these isms, and bring people together on a common platform to try to restore a free and a fair market. Sheikh Imran, the next question, uh, Muslims and non-Muslim alike, they live in, in, live in a state of confusion. It's come to a point where people don't believe anything anymore, and I refer here to what they hear in the news. Uh, we know that, or they know that most of what they hear is most probably going to be lies, fabrications. We now hear of fake news, even though the concept is as old as the printing press, if not even older. Uh, what guidance can Islam offer to such Muslim and non-Muslims alike in these times of confusion? My experience has been, and at the age of 76, I do have some experience in the world, and I have traveled, I've been blessed to travel extensively. He mm -hmm. said, yes, you are correct. There is a large part of the world of Islam out there which is asleep. Mm. And part of it is misguided. But the good news, which warms my heart, is that as I travel in the world, and now that we have the internet, we're able to go over all the walls and roadblocks that they established to prevent our word from reaching the people. Mm. I am amazed of how our young people in particular, our young people are able to grasp the truth and recognize the reality of the world today. And, and, and in some instances, they listen to me and then they advance my talk. And then I look to say, my Allah, look at that. Look at this thinker, this young man who is thinking. And uh, uh, nowhere, I have found it, yes, amongst, uh, in France, uh, the, the Arabs in France um, who have migrated from Algeria and Morocco and Tunisia and so on, mm -hmm. and they've been flocking to me. I have found from amongst them uh, this cutting edge capacity for thinking. And uh, to my surprise, I found native, native Frenchmen, mm -hmm. French people, mm -hmm. um, who have become my students and who are also capable of the same capacity to think in depth and recognize the truth. Um, I used to see it also in Malaysia and in Indonesia, but not as sharp as in, in mm -hmm. France. Um, and now that uh, I don't know about the United States because mm -hmm. I left the United States two weeks after 9-11 mm -hmm. and I never set foot again over there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, but over the last one year I've been visiting Britain. I came here one year ago to see my grandson because I was 75 years of age 
and my grandson was going to be four. I had never seen him and I was afraid I might die without ever seeing my grandson. I didn't know what the British government would do if I were to set foot in Britain. Mm -hmm. I'd never come to Britain for about 15 years or more. Mm -hmm. So I took a chance. I took a chance to come mm -hmm. so I could see my grandson. Mm -hmm. And uh, many people of course criticized me for that. Never mind. I wanted to see my grandson. But when I came to Britain one year ago, it was something absolutely amazing. I never even dreamed that it was possible. I found that in enormous appetite amongst the, the young people of Britain, mm -hmm. the young Muslims of Britain, born here, an enormous appetite to understand the reality of the world today. Mm -hmm. And they were flocking to me from all corners. And more than that, I found the scholars of Islam who were graduates of the Daru room mm -hmm. in this country. And why then, the, 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 you know the schoolboys who managed the masjid, the, the management committee, while they were closing the doors of the masjid for me, there were so many imams. So many Maulana, so many scholars who are flocking to me who want the knowledge of what is the reality of the world today. They were impressed by the methodology that was taught to me, how to use the Quran, how to study the Quran to be able to understand the world today. It's political reality, it's economic reality, it's monetary reality. And this is a good sign. That while one part of there is asleep mm -hmm. and another part is misguided, there is another part which is fresh, young, vigorous and exciting in their thirst for this knowledge. That's a good sign. Sheikh Imran, um, it's becoming evident that humanity will soon be exposed to uh, numerous psychological disasters. We see today on our seashores full-grown adult whales dying from suffocations as a result of, um, uh, uh, because of plastic. Um, what does this say about this consumerist mechanism that envelops all developed countries? And what solutions can Islam offer to alleviate such ecological disasters? It is not possible to save the world. No. Uh, if people choose to remain asleep, mm -hmm. they will dance to every tune that the Jal plays. Gog and Magog will take them, like the Pied Piper of Hamlin, to their destruction. And that's where the overwhelming majority of mankind are today. They have eyes and yet cannot see. And you can do what you want, you cannot change it. Since the ship is sinking, that's right. Mm -hmm. And you cannot prevent it from sinking. And when it sinks, it will take all on board to their destruction. What do you do? This is an accurate description of the world today. A ship which is sinking. It cannot be prevented from sinking. And when it sinks, all on board are going to be destroyed. What do you do? The answer is, and this is not my analogy, this is Fidel Castro. <laughs> Fidel Castro used this analogy mm -hmm. and I loved it. Mm -hmm. He said, the best thing to do is get off the ship. Mm -hmm. And when you get off the ship, mm -hmm. you can then advise others and assist others to get off the ship. Mm -hmm. Getting off the ship means leaving the cities of the modern age, the modern world, and seeking refuge particularly for your wives and children mm -hmm. in the countryside, producing your own food, becoming self-sufficient in food, mm -hmm. having your own source of water, your meat, your milk and so on, mm -hmm. and remaining in small communities. That is the way to respond to the present ecological um, crisis. Sheikh Imran. Um, last question, how significant is Imran Khan's victory in the latest Pakistan's general election? I like that question. <laughs> yes, he was a good cricketer. Mm -hmm. We share the same name, Imran. Mm -hmm. He was a good cricketer. Mm -hmm. 
a good captain. He fought as a cricketer. He fought courageously with determination. If you can stay at the wicket and fight and fight and fight when your team is in a crisis and take all the thunderbolts that are Freddy Truman might send against you, okay, and keep you to keep your wicket and stay there until you either draw the match or you win the game, then you are a good captain. And that's how he led from the front. And he he had the capacity to see which member of his team was not playing. Yeah, which one? Um, so I I don't consider him to be a professional politician. Mm -hmm. And I say thank God. And the Pakistani people are also saying thank God mm -hmm. that we don't have a politician now as our prime minister. Mm -hmm. a, a cricketer will do a better job or has the possibility of doing a better job than that whole uh, that whole jamaat of cor corrupted politicians and professional politicians, go your way, you fail. Mm -hmm. This cricketer might succeed where all of you have failed. Mm -hmm. However, having said that, having said that, uh, and that we look positively now to the possibility that Pakistan may have a different experience now under this government, uh, there is a warning to be delivered. And I'm going to deliver this warning on Saturday, inshallah, when I speak on uh, the Quran, uh, Pakistan's monetary and uh, economic predicament in the new Imran Khan's government. And that is, you have to be able to recognize that secular scholarship coming out of the universities have not only failed in the past, mm -hmm. but will continue to fail. Mm -hmm. Even if you are in the top 25 sc scholars of the world of economic thought, you know, Santa Claus always sends the list of the top 25, yeah. So, even if you have those scholars, mm -hmm. they fail in the past and they still fail. You cannot succeed with them. Mm -hmm. But what about the Maulanas? <laughs> Unfortunately, the world of Islamic scholarship also, it, it is inadequate. The training they got, the education they got is inadequate. But the bottom line is you cannot succeed in Rand Khan where every single government before you fail, you cannot succeed unless you go to the Quran. If you don't believe me, then go ahead and five years from now we'll see where you are. Mm -hmm. If you are to go to the Quran, to locate that guidance in the Quran, with which to explain and to respond to the predicament you have for the, then you need that scholarship. You need that kind of scholarship. Mm -hmm. And that was the scholarship that came from my teacher, Maulana Dr. Muhammad Fadur Rahman Ansari, and which I inherited. Mm -hmm. And we are always ready to assist the government. Yes, thank you. Sheikh Imran, Jazakumullah khair. We thank you for your time. And uh, it's been a great pleasure having you here. And you most welcome. Yes, thank you. We look forward to the next time. Inshallah. And to okay. Saturday's lecture as well. Inshallah. Okay. okay. Thank, thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa